Hello and welcome to Leveraging AI. This is Isar Metis, your host, and I have a great show for you today. My guest today, Mike Caput, has been in the forefront of helping businesses integrate AI in generally and specifically in the marketing world. He is part of the founding team of the Marketing AI Institute, and he's been doing this for seven years, so way before ChatGPT ever started. And we are going to talk about how to dramatically amplify the results of yourself and your team using AI. We're going to talk about specific use cases in marketing as well as in general business. This episode is brought to you by the Ultimate AI course. You can find that course on Multiply. That is spelled M-U-L-T-I-P-L-A-I. So like multiply, but instead of Y in the end, AI in the end multiplyai.ai forward slash AI dash course. There's going to be a link in the show notes. This course can take you from a complete beginner or wherever you are on your AI journey to understanding how to implement AI in a business context and how to build your business strategy around it. These courses are highly sought after and they fill out fast. So go and check it out. And if you do decide to take the course, you can use promo code Leveraging AI, all lowercase, leveraging AI to get $100 off the price of the course. At the end of this episode, I am going to share some news from this week. As every week in the AI world, there's some pretty big news happening. But now let's dive into how to significantly increase your output and the output of your business using AI. In the next few years, AI technology will change our world dramatically. Whether you are a business executive trying to catapult your business forward, or just somebody who refuses to be left behind and want to advance your career, this is the show for you. I'm your host, Isar Metis, a serial entrepreneur and an AI enthusiast. You'll hear invaluable practical tips from innovative business leaders, AI practitioners, and some of the brightest AI minds in our world today on how you can leverage AI in ethical ways to advance your career and grow your business. Hello and welcome to Leveraging AI, the podcast that shares practical, ethical ways to leverage AI to improve efficiency, grow your business, and advance your career. I am really excited about today's show, and I'm excited about today's shows for several different reasons. The first reason is that my guest today, Mike Caput, is a brilliant AI person. He has been writing, sharing content, and investigating how to use AI for marketing and in business in general for six or seven years. So he did not start recently when the big craze around ChatGPT came out, but he's been doing this for a very long time. He is in his profession. He's the chief content officer of the AI Marketing Institute, and he's the co-author of the book called Marketing Artificial Intelligence, which makes him an expert on how to use AI in businesses and especially in marketing. And that is going to be our topic today on how to use AI and AI tools in order to improve the efficiency and the results of various marketing aspects. And probably we'll dive into some general business aspects as well. In addition, I'm excited because Mike and I are both talking a lot of conferences about AI. And so our schedules weren't very easily <laughs> to set up. And we probably <laughs> rescheduled this interview four or five times in the past three or four months, most likely because of me more than Mike, but we finally are here together. And I know we're going to have an awesome conversation and share a lot of value. Mike, welcome to Leveraging AI. Oh, thanks for having me. I'm glad we were able to set this up. As I'm sure you can attest to, it's been a really banner year for AI speaking. We've always done a bit of speaking, but man, it has accelerated dramatically in the last 12 months. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. We were laughing about this. I, I, as soon as this interview is over, I'm actually driving to the <laughs> airport to fly to talk in another conference. And I'm sure Mike has maybe a few days, but not much more than that <laughs> for his next speaking gigs. But let's really dive in, Mike. Let's go and talk and define the setup, right? You're in a business. What are the things you're responsible for? And from there, let's start diving into how did you evaluate where does AI fits in? And then from there, the dive into how you're actually doing it. Absolutely. Yeah. So 
A few things that are important to note up front is first off, Marketing AI Institute is somewhat intentionally a very small, lean company. We just brought on two more people. They actually start today, which is cool. The day of recording, at least. <laughs> but we're now up to only about seven people. So we really do quite a bit for a really small team. On paper, I am the chief content officer, which means I'm in charge of growing our audience, but there's also a dozen, two dozen other hats I wear on any given day, depending how the business goes. So I will say for us, like given our size, this is a very iterative experimental process. We help larger organizations more formally define AI roadmaps. And we've got V1 of our own, but we're really moving very fast and doing a little kind of quick and dirty experimentation. So I don't know if there's some necessarily grand master AI five-year strategy here. It's more, let's actually start eating our own cooking. We advise people to start with pretty narrowly defined use cases that have high probabilities of success. That's not the only way to start applying AI to what you do, but it's a really good place to start. So in the day-to-day -day outside of our bigger strategic conversations, that's a lot of what I am working on and others are working on. So really looking at what am I spending the most time on in a given day or week, and how can we be applying increasingly some of these really powerful AI tools to dramatically shorten the amount of time it takes or get a better result for the same amount of time. I love that. I'll say one thing that is critical, and I share that with my clients. We both do very similar things, right? We create content, we share it, and we help in consulting to businesses. And what you just said is very critical because the biggest trick in applying AI is finding things that has high value, but also low risk. Mm -hmm. Doing internal projects, if it's an internal project, it could completely fall on its face. And yes, it will give you some weekend work to come up with the outcome <laughs> that you couldn't come up with your experiment, but it doesn't damage the business. It doesn't hinder any future strategy. It doesn't lose you clients. And it allows you to experiment more freely with different strategies and AI tools and so on, really reducing the risk. And if it works, now you can go and take it to your clients and apply it at a bigger scale and so on. So even from that concept, I think it's very important. So let's dive a layer deeper. You started saying you look for things that you spend a lot of time on and looking for ways to improve that with AI. So let's share some of those things and how you have been applying or things you're going to try in the near future. Yeah. So a big thing that we have applied AI to in various aspects is our podcast. And so okay. I'm going to start with a little context into what the podcast used to be, because it's important for where we were able to get to actually start using AI to actually capture more efficiency. So there's a piece of this that's actually before you even get to the AI piece, that's a strategy piece, a human piece to this. Our podcast used to be something where the format was our CEO, Paul, would interview AI experts, marketing AI people. They were awesome interviews, really valuable content. But we pretty quickly realized they were pretty unsustainable because Paul wasn't just a podcaster. Paul is the CEO of our company doing all this other really important strategic and business development work. And I'm somewhat aware of that problem. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> <laughs> so we aspirationally, it was like, this format's great. We'd love to hear these conversations every week with Paul and these leaders. But realistically, we just couldn't be spending like 10 plus hours of Paul's time on, and this was a couple of years ago too. So we weren't capturing as many efficiencies with AI, but at the time it's probably about 10 or so hours for him to say, here's the people I want. I have personal connections to them. So I'm going to get them on the show, schedule with them, et cetera, et cetera. So at the time, the podcast itself, we probably had put out about 20-ish episodes, and they were really infrequent. They were inconsistent. They were great. Barely built any type of audience. Now, so we before we were even saying, like, how can AI solve our problem here? We were like, are we even thinking about the strategy here the right way? So first, before we even got to applying AI to the workflow, which I'll talk about in a second, we actually had to take a step back and reevaluate this strategy. And we say, okay, look, even if we get AI helping us do this really well, Paul is still going to be spending an outsized amount of time on this format. So just sucks, but here's where we're at. We can't do this format. So we switched to a format where me and Paul every week 
cover top AI news. Now, that still takes a lot of work. And that workflow, which I'll get into in a second, still requires a lot of manual steps. But just changing the strategy alone suddenly freed up Paul's time. And we said, okay, this might be a little more sustainable. And so we started doing the podcast. We also got very lucky that we changed the format right before, I think like a month or two before ChatGPT came out. So there's this huge explosion in AI news at the time that really benefited the format. So a huge amount of this was just luck in terms of the podcast actually getting really popular, I would say. But at the time, basically what we're doing is curating all the AI news for the week, determining which things are most important, building out our commentary on it, and me essentially conversing with slash interviewing Paul about what is really important to know here. How can you sort out the signal from the noise for us? Format worked great. Podcast downloads took off, but this workflow still took a ton of time. We are still doing all of this manually, and at least Paul wasn't doing it, but our team, our small team, <laughs> including myself, we're spending a large amount of time on the podcast. It was super important to do, but we were like, okay, now that we've got a strategy dialed in, so how I do wanna, we- I want to pause it just for one second because I want to highlight two very important things on the subtext of what you said. One is that, again, we both do this for a living, but we are huge believers in a business is a business first. Mm. Like any AI pixie dust you're going to throw on it is not <laughs> going to make a major difference. It starts with strategy, and then you have to figure out the business processes that will support that strategy, and then mm. you can try to find the AI tools to solve some of those steps within the new process that you've defined. So that's number one that is critically important. The other thing that I want to say, for those of you who do not have a podcast and are thinking like, I don't want to listen to this anymore, this applies to anything that you're going to do in marketing and probably in business, because the process that Mike is talking about now generalizing this is how do I collect a large amount of information that is relevant to my industry mm -hmm. on a weekly basis and analyze it in a way that will allow me to have a business benefit. In Mike's case is producing a podcast that drives leads and people to the conference and so on. But the same process can be applied to any business intelligence collection and analysis that you just cannot do today because it's too time consuming. Sorry for stopping you. Let's no, continue. that's so important. That's such a critical point to mention is, yeah, this is not about on the surface. It sounds like it's about how to do better podcasting. It's an analogy for, no, here's how you theoretically could go about and transform any business or marketing process that you might be struggling to do efficiently. So keep that in mind. Yeah, as I'm sharing some of these steps because, yeah, the first step was, are we even doing the right thing? Is this even sustainable? A second step is, okay, now that we know we have some confidence we're doing the right thing, what does the process look like? What are all the steps that go into it? So this type of process mapping is so important. And honestly, it's a great exercise, even if you're like, we can't use AI for any of this. It's still really helpful to say, okay, there's some redundant steps in here. There's some things we could do better. So that was our kind of next step of saying, okay, now that we have this big manual process that we do to produce something that we know is working, what is every single step in that process? So literally a whole checklist of here's every piece of what happens to get the podcast out the door. And after, here's how the content is created based on that podcast. Or we produce several articles from each episode. Here's how the promotion is created. And then from there, it became iteratively applying artificial intelligence tools to certain parts of it. And there's plenty of parts of the process today that still are manual, but even by applying just a little bit of AI to some key areas, we have reduced the time it takes to put this podcast out by 75%. So wow. it's that's huge for us. That's just a game changer. And honestly, it's still such early days, I would say, with it. As much as we've captured all these efficiencies, it's wow, okay, how can we even do this better? Or how can we apply what we've learned here to other workflows? So as an example, one big thing that we're doing with AI is using AI to professionally edit like video and audio. So we used to have to hire a production company to do this because we don't have very strong video and audio editing skills in-house. Using 
for one tool in particular, Descript, which is a great podcast editing tool or audio editing tool. We have someone who's able to do that very quickly internally. And then we're able to actually take the transcript from that tool and then we run it through Pick Your Poison, ChatGPT, Claude 2, things like that. And we're actually able to turn that transcript very quickly into summaries that are then used in blog posts. We can have it actually break down takeaways for us just to make give a bunch of raw material to a human writer, often myself, and say, hey, can you actually layer in your unique expertise, creativity, and insight, knowing what you know from, as you said, doing this for six or seven years at this point, that's a what comes out of that is a blog post that is far better than anything I would write from scratch. It is very quick to write, and it has a unique point of view that we wouldn't get just by clicking a button saying, chat GPT, write something interesting for me, which I wouldn't really counsel people to. <laughs> so I, I want to jump on a few points that you said, because again, they're pure gold. The first one, which is, or if you want the last one that you just said, is that the real trick is finding ways to have this integrated approach of human and AI, right? Mm -hmm. Let AI do the tedious, mundane, annoying part of the work and bring your point of view, your unique thinking, your background, your experience, mm -hmm. or human connections, whatever it is, into it in order to make it really a great piece of content. And that applies to anything that you do with AI. And by the way, even just the AI stuff, you can train it over time to do more of the work for you. So in the mm -hmm. beginning, you can use it just to write bullet points. Later on, you can train it how to write in your voice. And then maybe the bullet points have some more meat on them and they have, and you need to do less. You still want to add your point of view because that's what's going to make it unique. That's what'll make it you versus, yes. oh, anybody else can hit the button and write the same blog post. So what am I really bringing to the table? And if I want to go a step back to what you said, going back to how you've apply this is find the steps in the process where these tools shine the most. In the case that you mentioned, it's okay. We still do the podcast, meaning there's still two people talking to one another, exploring an idea. There's still content being produced, but in the middle, there's this process of how do I take the content from the podcast? So it was two people talking to one another. It's an audio recording mm -hmm. and turn it into valuable key points that I can then expand on when I create content, whether it's long form or short form or whatever content you want to create. That is really tedious and annoying. It's literally listening to the whole <laughs> thing and taking yep. notes and writing them aside and making sure that they're cohesive. And all of that, Claude 2 or ChatGPT or Llama or what, whichever tool you use, I use Claude for that because for long form content and summarization, just amazing. It takes about five seconds. <laughs> and if you are smart enough, and I'll add a small little tip for those of you who are not doing it, if you create a prompt library for your company and save the prompts that do these little steps, you don't have to reinvent the wheel. So I use a tool called Magical Chrome Extension, which is just a Chrome extension that you can save really short snippets, and it will write down long paragraphs for you. Mm -hmm. And I use that in my organization across other people and teams sharing through folders, different prompts. So when I want to do a step in a process that requires two or three different prompts, there is, let's take in your case, summarize a podcast. I will write a shortcut called some pod, which is not a word. So we'll never randomly type it. And it will then prompt the full three paragraphs that I want. And then I have some pod two after it has done the first step to get the second step and so on. So in, I don't know, three words that I write and a few seconds of the large language model doing its thing, I've got an outcome that I can use for whatever I need to use. And like I said, generalizing it, you can use this for any business process. Let's go back to the first step of what you said, because I think that has a lot of value to businesses in general. You said content collection. You're somehow screening. And those of you, again, shameless plug for my, what's the name of the podcast? The Marketing Artificial Intelligence Show. Okay. So the show is amazing. Those of you who don't listen and you're listening to this, go sign up for that as well. It's another great show. And it's probably the best show out there to stay 
up to date with what's going on in the AI world while analyzing the news. So it's not such a news stream, but Mike and Paul literally go in and say, okay, here's why this is important. Why should mm-hmm. you care? And so on. But to do that, you have to know what happened each week and a lot happens each week <laughs> in AI now. Going back to generalization, you can do the same thing for any industry on any topic. Yep. So how, what steps are you taking today and what AI tools are you using in the process or not necessarily AI tools in order to collect and then summarize the data in a way that allows you to even define what goes into the show? Yeah, it's a great question. So first off, I'll say in terms of actually getting links to possibly interesting news, that is an aspirational use case for us today for AI, I would say, because that's largely manual still today. We're lucky in the sense it's not a huge burden because we're already reading and looking for these resources as part of our other work anyway. So that's not a huge lift for us to be doing. It's something that happens. It would be happening if we didn't have a podcast. So really, you're starting with a ton of different, honestly, each week, it's probably 30, 40 different links, at least to different news items we've collected in a central kind of chat throughout the week. Then from there, AI can be really helpful in summarizing the articles in unpacking for me with some of the longer ones. Like, what are the takeaways here? I will still today, as of right now, read every article, no matter how long it takes. Again, that helps me do my job better generally, even if we didn't have a podcast. There's certainly an argument to be made if you were doing this in another marketing process or industry, you could absolutely get away with not having to read every single thing. But basically, I'll have certain tools. Claude, too, is, like you mentioned, one of the ones I and find increasingly a go-to to just quickly summarize for me news items. I think it's also really helpful in terms of describing or simplifying certain topics to me. Occasionally there'll be like a paper that comes out or especially meta, I feel like is guilty of this. They'll release these really cool like multimodal models and I'm like reading it and I'm like, I think I need a PhD to understand all of this. So it actually really helped me say, okay, what are the points I can extract from my audience to really simplify this? Because you can lose people in jargon, in really technical stuff. So that's been really helpful. It's almost, hey, explain it to me like I'm five because A, I need that. (laughs) B, that's honestly how the audience will get more value out of it given our audience. Not that they're all beginners, but they're often really hoping to get to the practical, actionable advice on this stuff. So summarization and explaining concepts are really important to how we curate. Now, there is a piece here that honestly, I'd certainly be open to having AI curate this for me. I would love to explore that. We haven't really done that yet. I think there's a secret sauce here today, at least having myself and Paul, our CEO, curate this because we do have a sense of Here's what I think will actually be important because of all the context and background we have built up this kind of hard one experience, which is like the one thing that AI probably won't be able to do in a year or two. So there is a really interesting mix here of humans working with machines to get to this essentially research brief that informs the entire episode. And from there, once we've got so, okay. Again, I just want to pause you for a second because again, if I want to generalize it for people, let's say you want to do research about stuff that's happening in your mm-hmm. industry or your clients or and so on. You have some kind of a centralized location. I don't know if it's a Slack channel or a Google Sheets or whatever you're using, but that everybody involved just drops links of interesting mm-hmm. stuff that they're seeing. I assume that's step one. Step two, you're taking those links at the end of each week, dropping them into Claude 2 and getting a summarization, and as you said, in some cases, a simplification of what the stuff says. Now you have, I assume, a document of some sort with all the main things and then all the main topics. Do you then yourselves prioritize them, or you still let the AI tool now prioritize what of that is more important, more in-depth, and so on? Today, it's 100% us prioritizing. Yeah. Again, yes. I would be open to seeing what could be done. Like, I'm not going to be skeptical that AI will be able to do this. But we have found it really useful to say, okay, this is, we know this is going to be important upcoming. Or one example, we are ramping up here in the next few months to host a virtual AI for Agency Summit in early November. So anything that is really interesting from an agency perspective, for instance, we might actually elevate to a main topic in the podcast because 
because it's a natural piece of content to start nurturing more of that audience. So it's 100% manual today, but I wanted to maybe double click on something you said and yeah, zoom out and say, okay, forget the podcast. Like what I just described is literally to your point, a process you could use for a blog post, a long form report or asset, your newsletter, any type of piece of content you are creating comes from some other research generally, whether it's your own subject matter experts, external research, especially as things like Google Docs, Google Workspace incorporate more AI features. I still use Claude too, but you might get away with in the near future, drop all this stuff into a Google Doc and you can use AI right in there to start summarizing and simplifying. So yeah, just like a quicker, I call it internally and in my head, like a quicker time to knowledge. Like instead of me having to sit here and like sift through all of this stuff, I can very quickly get a sense of, oh, I just consumed a huge amount of information. And that skill, that's the transferable skills. You can consume and synthesize a vast amount of information very quickly by using these types of workflows. Yep. And the same thing goes, by the way, for those of you who don't know, the same thing goes for video. So there are plugins within ChatGPT as well as external tools, as well as plugins for YouTube on Chrome that will literally summarize what the video is about. So if it's a 40 minute video, you can read five bullet points yep. with timestamps and decide whether you want to watch the full video, whether you want to jump to minute 13 and 53 seconds to watch this segment rather than watching 40 minutes of video. So regardless of what means of consumption you have for the content, there are ways today to really understand what the content is about, to decide for yourself, like Mike said, do you want to consume the deeper, broader content and go and read, watch, listen to the rest of it? So this is how you guys curate the content. You talked a little bit about the post-production using the script, which is, I agree, an incredible tool. We'll put a link to that in the show notes for those of you who won't remember the name or know what to use. What other things in the process? You talked initially about content distribution and some mm -hmm. other stuff that you use AI for in your marketing process. Yeah. So right now, when it comes to distribution, it's incredibly helpful as well. And again, this is where strategy meets AI and together they're far more powerful than they are individually. So the strategy is now instead of us, and this used to be for years, our strategy, we used to create blog posts from scratch on highly searched topics. And it was a great strategy and it worked really well. It took a, an enormous amount of time. And now today, given that anyone can click a button and write that sort of post, the value of that strategy is still probably valuable in a lot of contexts, but it might not be worth us spending that amount of time on that strategy anymore. Now, that's just us, but that's where we got to. So instead, we we're like, okay, the podcast is the content strategy. Whatever we are talking about, that's what blog posts we are writing in a given week. So that alone is a really powerful shift because then you can say, all right, how do I use AI tools to quickly get to really solid blog posts on that topic? And once you do that, then you can start using AI tools in a couple of different ways to very quickly say, okay, let's have AI write us a bunch of social media shares. And we still have humans go through and say, these are good, these ones are bad, or hey, none of these are perfect, but they gave me ideas to write my own. So when it comes to written social shares, it is used very heavily across a variety of tools. We're always like testing, especially when it comes to writing like four or five different tools. So can you share all... which ones you're using right now, which one you find the most user-friendly for what use cases? Because I'm sure there's different yeah. pros and cons. Yeah, for sure. So when it comes to say writing like tweets or like shares for LinkedIn for our corporate account or get again, getting just ideas, it's things like writer, writer.com is a great writing platform. We also use Jasper quite a bit. And then tools like Claude2 and ChatGPT. Those are probably the four that are in rotation. Honestly, I don't know if I could say like one is dramatically better than the other today. I think it just is really what you're feeling on a given day. Or if you say, look, you might go to something like ChatGPT or Claude in a pinch if you're trying to say, okay, I want you to write in a few different styles, or I want to get a little more conversational about what I'm really looking for if I have something special in mind I'm trying to get at. But all those tools work really well for this kind of use case. And then 
We also are using AI or experimenting with it because this process is still under construction, is getting to short video clips from the podcast. So taking our big, long recording and splicing it up into short video clips. I'm not as close to that process in kind of my role, but my colleagues are using tools like Gloss AI. There's a tool called Munch out there. They're experimenting with how do we get to a couple of other or how are we able to quickly create these short videos for things like YouTube shorts? And stuff like this is really valuable for us because historically we just didn't have time to spend all this energy and resources on video production like that. But as anyone knows, short form video is pretty important to be doing. So it's an area that was a blind spot for us that we're now starting to get to a, a kind of AI assisted workflow that can hopefully get us across those channels. And even just very initially, it's nothing crazy, but our YouTube shorts are now doing really well and we wouldn't have had them without some type of AI help. Awesome. Two points that you said that are critical that I want to mention. One is a lot of people use AI tools for writing because it's pretty obvious it's good at writing. What you said is that it's a very good tool for ideation and a lot of people miss that. And that could be ideation for business strategy. Mm -hmm. That could be ideation for a sales process. That could be ideation on how to solve a technical problem. That could be ideation on what to write about that will work well this week, this month in relation to something that happened, et cetera. So it's an amazing ideation tool. And a lot of people miss that because they're focused about the actual outcome. Oh, yep. I need a tweet. So I wanted to write a tweet. I'm like, eh. I don't think you wanted to write a tweet. I think you need an idea for a great tweet and then mm -hmm. you want to write it. Yeah. And so that's one thing that you said that I think is critical. The other thing is, and, and you mentioned before 75% savings in time. And now you mentioned the ability to do stuff you were not be you were not able to do before. One of the things I talk about both in my talks on stage as well as with my clients is that we are trained to think on small increments of efficiency in a process. Why? Because this would has been done in business for ever. That's it. Like, how do I do this a little better? 5% better, 3% better, 7% better. Because that travels to the bottom line one way or another. That doesn't exist anymore. Right. There are literally constraints that are used to be a given that just cease to exist. And if I'll just piggyback on the example you used, one of the tools that you mentioned knows how to take long form video and on its own, select the best content out of it for short videos. And there's a mm -hmm. bunch of tools who do that little trick, which means you were not able to do this before at all because you just didn't have enough bandwidth because you're a team of seven people doing a lot of things. And now you can do this and you can do this successfully. And there's another channel that drives leads, that drives awareness that creates context that opens doors with almost zero extra effort. So you can get to on specific things, on little aspect of the process to infinite scalability on that little thing. If you find the right process and the right tool, and if it supports your strategy, it's a gold mine. Mm. And so from a mindset perspective, you have to stop looking for little incremental benefits and say, okay, what is the outcome I'm trying to get? What is the outcome? In your case, I want another channel that I know that is really important and I just don't have the time to invest in going through the video every week and selecting the segments and so on. Can I get to that outcome? Is there an AI tool or another tool or a mix of them through some automation that can do that? And if there is, that's it. You're at the outcome. You don't have to figure out small little incremental steps to get there. And now you get the outcome. So these two things, one is that stop thinking on small incremental steps, look at the outcome. And the other thing that you said about ideation, I think are very critical to gain benefits from AI like today. Ideation is something I'm so glad you mentioned because I think people sleep on it. Like I, if I had entry-level advice for somebody when it comes to AI, it would be like, you should probably have a tool, let's just say chat GPT for purpose of ease. You should probably have that tool in open in a separate window 
as you go about your entire workday, because there's going to be a lot of things you'll ask it, or you might not be good at asking it certain things that you'll be like, ah, okay, that wasn't that helpful. It is crazy. I probably use it a hundred times a day for just simple ideation. And I wonder, you can't quantify this, but I guarantee you that has a profound effect over time on both my ability to come up with really good ideas, but also quickly getting to ideas I probably would have gotten to anyway. So it's just as like that kind of ideation and even strategy assistant. I think people are sleeping on that because to your point, they want that carefully crafted outcome. They want to be like, oh, here's the tweet. Here's the post. No, no, no. How much other stuff do you do in a given day that is just coming up with ideas and starting to move those ideas forward? Fantastic. What else? What other stuff in your process you use AI for that people can learn and benefit from? So I will say one of the other big pieces here in terms of specifics is definitely when it comes to actually writing content, I will say my personal workflow has changed quite a bit. I alluded to this a bit before, but it's, I would say a year or so ago, I was probably using AI tools just for ideation, but now I will actually be using a couple, not even that complex prompts to really get a better overall outcome. To your point about outcome, I'm not saying you should be using AI to write your posts necessarily. However, what's really cool is now that we've executed consistently on this strategy, we now have 50 plus blog posts that are all the same format, the same really quick hitting, insightful style we want. Now I'm starting to use tools that are prompted or trained on those posts. So we haven't built any like customized model yet, but I can now take our best posts and say, hey, here's three examples of a post style I really like. Please analyze it and keep it in mind as I ask you to write things moving forward. So I'm at the point where I can literally feed something like Claude 2, three of my best posts. They're on the same format. They have this like specific, here's the key takeaways. Here's some connecting the dots. And it learns the style exactly. And then I drop in a podcast transcript and say, now that you know what you know about my best writing, please write a post in the exact same style. And we're not hitting publish on that post because it's still making things up from the transcript. It'll even give you quotes that aren't exactly right in the transcript, even though it has the exact quote, it'll polish it up or change it. And you're like, please don't do that. <laughs> but I'll literally have this amazing first draft in two seconds. Then I'm like, oh, okay, this is exactly where I would have gotten to anyway. Now I'm going to just rewrite this as me. That is really interesting. And that might seem like a little scary or weird, for people that are really, I'm a writer by trade, like that's a different new thing. And it gets into some weird questions about creativity and what does a human do? What does a machine do? But something like that, I personally feel very comfortable with because it's still all, if it wasn't coming from our original point of view on the podcast, maybe it's a different story. But I think you, once you have some of, once you build some of this momentum, getting some content you like, or getting a voice you like, you can really start fine tuning these tools to do things that are unique to you that other people can't really duplicate. So I would say that's the other big piece here where we're active seeing what's possible with AI when it comes to what does it mean? What is the future of writing with these tools? That's what I'm interested in exploring. I absolutely love what you said. And I want to, again, expand on that or generalize it to other fields other than marketing. A lot of people hear and go crazy about, oh, we need to train our own model because mm. then we'll be able to do all these things, which is true. You can do really magical things if you train your own model. That's a pretty long and expensive process. And depending on the size of the model you want to train and how much data you have, you're talking between twenty, thirty thousand dollars on the low end to a couple of millions on the high end. And probably the average would be two to three hundred thousand dollars and a few good months invested into training your own model in a proper way. That being said, there's a very quick shortcut, which is here are some things that we're doing that worked very well. And I want to use them and give them to the AI as part of a pre-prompt to what I wanted to do next. And you mentioned it for writing blog posts, but you can do that for your proposals. Mm -hmm. Here are five proposals that worked really well for us and they won and they were really profitable. So 
I want to write a proposal like one of those with the language and the structure and the bullet points that we mentioned and whatever else went in there. And the preset and the repeating sections are just about the business. There's stuff that goes into writing a proposal that you don't need to do anymore. Even another step is saying, okay, here's the RFP and here is the proposal that we wrote to it. So now you can feed it an RFP and say, analyze the RFP based on how we wrote the proposals, mm. write the proposal based on the same kind of concepts. You can do this for product design. Here is the best 20 strip sprints we had in the last five years as far as doing them effectively and so on. I want to, I want your help in writing the next sprint from my product, et cetera, et cetera. Like literally you can take this to anything you're doing in a business and saying, okay, because a lot of companies saying we don't have data. Like how are you going to train if you don't have data? Do you have shitloads of data? <laughs> Consider it data, but literally everything... Sales emails. How many sales emails have your sales team sent in the last three years? Probably tens of thousands. These can be used. Look at the ones that got the best results. Look at the people that are the best performers. Take their sales process, even if they don't really have one, just copy and paste what they write in their sales emails, in the first email and second email. Let chat GPT or any other model, see what it is and say, I want you to write like this in my first email on that topic to that client. And it will know how to massage the things together. And I think this is such a critical point because this is maybe the place that is literally money laying on the floor when mm. it comes to using AI that any business can use today that probably 99% of businesses are not doing. Honestly, this is one of the most valuable points I've ever heard made, and I think needs to be repeated quite often. Yeah, every words, just sub out the term words and put data in instead. Are you doing a talk? Are you doing a podcast? Are you soliciting comments for feedback for your event, which we just got for our conference? All of this is data. All of this can be used to actually learn more about your customers, to build better strategies, forget the productivity piece, which is huge. You can actually be taking sales calls and getting insights from them very quickly using some of these tools as long as you have permission to use that data. There is a wealth of things beyond just writing that you can do with words when it comes to these models. Mike, I think this is an awesome note to end on. I think this is a very important point. This was really awesome and really helpful and valuable, I'm sure, for a lot of people. If people want to follow you, learn from you, work with you, connect with you, what are the best ways to do that? Sure. So first off, go to marketingaiinstitute.com. You can very easily figure out everything we do, see all of our education, get in touch with us. I'd highly recommend reach out to me on LinkedIn. I'm very easy to find Mike Kaput on LinkedIn, Chief Content Officer at Marketing AI Institute. Please feel free to connect with me, message me. It's a huge way to start more awesome conversations about maybe how we can help you figure out your next steps with AI. Those would be the two best ways. Awesome. Mike, thank you so much. This was absolutely awesome. Thank you. This was great. What a fun and important conversation with Mike. Mike is, first of all, a really great guy. And also he knows AI extremely well. He has been doing this for a very long time. And that shows in the conversation I had with him. A lot of really great points in this conversation. And I think the biggest one is start with strategy and then look for the right AI tools in order to achieve the goals that you set for yourself in that strategy. And now to some really big news from this week. As in past weeks, the big players' news keep on rolling out. So the first one we're going to start with is LinkedIn. LinkedIn has made a big announcement that they're adding AI tools to basically everything LinkedIn, but obviously starting first and foremost with their paid platforms. As you know, LinkedIn belongs to Microsoft and Microsoft owns 49% of OpenAI. So obviously it's powered by OpenAI in the back end. Several of the tools they mentioned, one is Recruiter 2024, which is going to be their new recruiter platform, has AI to help better job candidate searches. They've also announced LinkedIn Learning is going to get an AI coach chatbot that can give you skills advice based on your personal criteria, as well as your background and things you're looking for. They have added a marketing tool that's called Accelerate to simplify running campaigns on LinkedIn. 
and there's an AI sales assistant coming up. So across more or less all the different paid tools that you get on LinkedIn, there's going to be some kind of an AI assistant. Not a big surprise, as I mentioned in every previous episode, every large platform and eventually over time, medium and small platforms will have to add these kind of features. Another huge company that that have announced releasing different AI tools and expanding his offering in general is Zoom. Zoom has seen obviously a huge boom during the pandemic. And then as people started going back to the office and could leave the house, Zoom stock price has tanked. And now they're looking for other ways to grow their business. They have announced they're releasing Zoom Docs that allows collaborative document creation for meetings. They've announced an AI companion chatbot that can generate highlights and summaries and catch-ups from different meetings. And in general, they're expanding the capabilities of Zoom to include additional tools to run the business and not just to do the meetings. That's obviously a very crowded and competitive space with companies like Slack and Microsoft and Google but it will also make Zoom a more comprehensive approach and more sticky and will provide more value. How will that thing play out? I don't know. But as I mentioned earlier with LinkedIn and with previous companies, they don't have much of a choice. They will have to add these kind of AI capabilities. And for them, it actually makes sense because it expands them into more verticals that connects to what they already do. Last week, I've shared with you all the big announcements that Meta released as part of their chatbots across all the different chat platforms. And this week they have announced that they are adding AI supported tools for their advertisers. So now you can use AI to generate backgrounds, generate the actual images, change the background to have different feels to the products that you want to sell, get different text variation of ad copy for the ads you're creating and so on and so forth. Different AI tools to help advertisers create better ads faster and with less investment, which makes a lot of sense because that means that more people will be able to create ads and they'll be able to create more ads, which means more money to Meta through their advertising, which is how they make all their money. They are also announced that they're developing an AI for business chatbot that will allow you to chat through that with customers. Also makes a lot of sense because there are already tools out there offering AI-based chat services for customer service and sales and so on that are connected with and running on WhatsApp, which is one of the most widely used chatting apps in the Western hemisphere. So again, makes a lot of sense. Maybe the coolest announcement this week comes from Canva. Canva, the design giant, just announced a whole suite of AI tools. They call it Magic Studio, and it includes multiple tools that allows you to create images from scratch and create designs and videos and select items from within an image and change that particular item and create media and create text and copy and morph and transform words and shapes and so on all with AI. If you didn't watch their video, I highly recommend you do that. It's a highly comprehensive suite of tools for anybody who wants to create better designs faster. It looks extremely powerful and it's going to be available to any paid members on the Canva platform. I have to summarize all the news I shared so far from this week. They all have to do with really large companies with really established, huge, large customer base that are releasing AI capabilities to provide even more functionality faster and better on their platforms. And as I mentioned in previous episodes, this is going to continue happening. There's some other interesting news from this week, but I'm going to share them in links in the show notes if you want to check that. But the last piece of news I want to share with you comes from DeepMind. DeepMind is a company that Google bought a few years ago and that have been an independent AI research group within Google and earlier this year, merged with their internal research group. And they have some of the top AI scientists in the world. Their researchers just released a paper that's saying that they've developed what they call Prompt Breeder, which is basically an AI system that automatically improves prompts in large language models. What's interesting about this is that it allows people who do not know how to prompt to create extremely good prompts because the AI itself keeps on improving the original prompt until it gets to an optimal outcome. What does that tell us? It tells us something that I've said several times in previous episodes, that prompt engineering, while right now is extremely important, 
will be a thing of the past in the very near future because the AI will be able to understand the context of what we're talking about. It will be able to understand what we're trying to achieve and will help us achieve this in the most optimal way without us having to know exactly how to prompt. And if for whatever reason you think that doesn't make any sense, think about the early days of the internet. You had to be a network engineer in order to communicate between two computers. And I would just go on the internet and type something and it connects and we don't really care what's happening in the background. And the same exact thing is going to happen with AI. It will really understand very well what we're trying to do. And we will not have to be prompt gurus in order to get those results because the AI itself in the background will create the extra prompting and whatever needs to happen in order to get us the best results that we need related to the context that we're trying to get it in. That's it for this week. Go and test AI, share what you've learned with the world. Go and check out the AI course by Multiply. If you are considering advancing your career with AI, or if it's something you know you have to bring into your business, this course is fantastic. It got raving reviews from multiple people in different sizes of companies. So go check it out. And until next time, have an amazing week. <music>